Yo, this is crazy. Check this out. Uh, you had a lot of requirements to meet to get this. Now we're going to talk about the Clotilde on the tour, which was the last ship to come in with illegally kidnapped individuals on it in 1860. But we had many ships to come in prior to that. And through research uh, and a lot of work, we found five ships that we could actually document. Uh, when we do these markers, it can't just be my history, it can't be folklore, it's got to be valid and valid vetted. And so we found that in 1721, there were three ships that came into Mobile with illegally kidnapped individuals on them. And, um, on the other side of this marker, it gives you the names of them and the number that were on that ship and the number that left Africa and the number that got here was totally different. So in one of them, it was a difference of about a hundred people, meaning that they either died, they got, they killed them or they committed suicide. And that was pretty much uh, consistent on all of the ships that came to the Americas uh, during that time period, but uh, that's it. That's the UNESCO marker, and uh, mm -hmm. that's it. That's that's the UNESCO marker, and uh, you'll be hearing a lot about more about UNESCO because they're putting these up all over the world, and it's a, a it's it's an organization that's very uh, academic and. Um, very diverse in a lot of different areas of international uh, causes. And so uh, this particular one is just uh, giving recognition to those ships that entered into not only the U.S. but all over the world with illegally kidnapped in individuals on it. So it's, it's honoring the memory of, of those individuals. Um, a lot of people will take vacations just to UNESCO sites. Okay. Um, and so that's that's our market there, which puts us puts us on the international, basically uh, marketplace with, with that market. This is our convention center. Yeah. So this rich white plantation owner by the name of Timothy Maher made a bet with another plantation owner that he could bring in a hundred illegally kidnapped individuals from Africa. Wow. Which, at that time, slavery was still legal. But the Slave Act of 1808 had passed. And it said it was illegal to import anyone from outside of the country. And if you did, got caught, and was tried by a jury and found guilty, you could be hung. Well, he took this chance anyway. He goes out and he hires this guy by the name of Captain Foster. Captain Foster hires eight crewmen. And then they purchased this 86 foot schooner called the Clotilde. And Captain Foster and his eight crewmen, they leave out the Port of Mobile with about 75 yards of lumber stacked on the top of the boat as if they were going to Houston or South America to sell it because Alabama was a forestry state then and it's a forestry state today. It looked normal, but instead what they did on the way to Africa they built 130 slots underneath the boat to house the individuals that they were going to bring back. They get to Africa, they get to a country called the Kingdom, you know, it's just like Mobile and Mobile. Some people say Dahomey, and some people just say Dahomey, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so today that is Badin. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have to take a five minute commercial break, five seconds, 15 seconds. See over here to the right? See that bridge? It's suspended like a two-mast ship. That is the Africa Town Bridge. The Clotilde was a two-mast ship. And that was built in 1995 uh, to take us up, up over that water. Before that, we had a little two-lane bridge that was a drawbridge so that when the ships would come down the bay, it could open up to let them through. We're going to reference that bridge uh, shortly. So Captain Foster gets to Benin, 
first thing he does is he gets an interpreter. He tells the interpreter he wants 130 people. Even though the bet was for 100, he said, if I have to kill some, some die or commit suicide, I've got to bring Timothy Mayer back 100 individuals. So, he was somewhat shrewd. They go to this warehouse, there's over 4,000 illegally kidnapped, naked individuals in that warehouse. Captain Foster said, look, for every man, get me a woman. For every little boy, get them a little girl. And get them from four or five different tribes. Now, as you know, a lot of our uh, locals don't know. Because see, when they look at Africa, they don't think about like Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Germany, Switzerland. Those are all different cultures, all different nationalities. For some reason, we have a tendency to look at Africa as being the same. But it's 57 different countries and 57 different cultures and 57 different languages, as you know. So we, we kind of make that distinction. And when Captain Foster got them from different tribes, his concept was that he would have less of a chance of a mutiny upon return because they didn't all speak the same language. So he gets his 130 people and they're at the, uh, they're at the docks loading up to come back to the US. And for some reason, some of the enslavers started to retrieving some of the individuals that they had sold. There's different readings. Some readings say that that was a game they played. Some say that when they saw them putting the shackles and chains on it, they knew it was a different type of slavery that they were accustomed to, and they didn't agree with it. So Captain Foster had to leave in a hurry. He leaves with only 110. He's headed back to the US. Well, we had some abolitionists in Mobile at the time. Those were people that were against slavery. Somebody told the federal authorities and the custom agents that there was a ship coming in with illegally kidnapped individuals on it. And they were on the lookout for the hotel. Well, Timothy Mayer owned most of the property in this area where we are. And he had a shipbuilding business and he had a uh, paper mill company. So he had a lot of clout, a lot of money. He was a man about the community. Somebody alerted him. And so he sends one of his paddle boats out to meet the Clotilde. So here's the sign that says, Welcome to Africa Town, Plateau, Magazine, Happy Hill, Kelly Hills, Lewis Quarters. These are all the colloquial communities under that umbrella of Africa Town. So Jimmy DeMere, when he found out that there were going to be uh, that they were on the lookout for the Clotilda, he sends one of his paddle boats out to meet the Clotilda. And they did. And so what they did at that point was they transferred the 110 people on the Clotilda to the paddle boat and they hid them in the cane break, which is the front part of the paddle boat. And uh, And so when they did that, they brought the paddle boat in, spit it through the docks that they left out. They went around on the other side of the tunnel <clears throat> through uh, what we call the causeway. And they went about 12 miles north of this bridge through the Spanish River back into our Delta. And then they just uploaded those people in the woods in shackles and chains naked just left them they brought the clotilde in the same route and they set it afire to sink it because during this brief period of time the guy that financed this timothy mayor had been bragging all over the country i brought in a hundred people illegally right under the federal government's eyes and they didn't catch me just bragging about it and so it hit the news and so he was arrested as well as Captain Foster. But they couldn't hold them because they could not and couldn't prosecute them because they couldn't find the ship. And they said the stench was so bad on that ship that if they had found it, they would have known that that was the vessel that they had come in on. Because see, 
if you've ever seen one of those vessels on TV, there's always water in the bottom. And that's where they ate, that's where they slept, that's where they regurgitated, that's where they defecated. Some even died. And they said a lot of times they come in missing a finger or a toe, and there's only one rodent that can digest food on the water. That's a rat. So environmentally, it was just unsanitary and un, uh, inhumane, the environment. And they said the stench was so bad. And they said it would bring them up to exercise um, every couple of weeks, but it really wasn't. It was to entertain, because they were molesting the little girls and raping the, the ladies. Uh, so the whole environment was just uh, very unacceptable. Um, so once they got here, though, um, they would march them over to that building that we were at, and they would keep them in there for uh, maybe a week. And while they were in there, they would remove any abrasive marks from the shackles and the chain. And uh, on a day like today, they may would have an auction. And an auctioneer would step out of those two doors with one of the individuals and start the bidding process. And they would say something like, black male, 18 years old, all teeth, good health, and start the bidding. 500,000, 1,500. Sometimes they would sell for as much as $3,000, okay? Now, those individuals knew that slavery had existed for years, but it was a different type of slavery. It was indentured service and they could buy their freedom and become part owners of some of the companies that bought them. And, uh, but this was different. It had never ever existed anywhere else in the world. When they were sold, they were sold like a, a car or a piece of furniture or a cow. And they became the property of that individual for the rest of their lives, including their offspring, okay? These people had no idea they were in Mobile, Alabama or on a different continent. But they knew once they were sold, they may not ever see their husband, wife, or children again. So that was a big uh, fear. They had a lot of anxiety about that. Um, and you could determine why they would be so uncomfortable with the whole process. Um, that's what took place at that slave market. Hope that we'll never ever see anything like that again. Uh, as you all know, especially coming from Atlanta, the biggest weapon that we got is the vote. So you all must be aware of history, of what's going on in the world, and you've got to participate in that process. Um, as we take the two, y'all, we're so close back to the 1870s, the things that were going on, it is you mind about it. It's just a little different fabric, the way they're presented but we have to really understand what's taking place in our government today. You know, and of all places, Atlanta. If, if, if one of those people that said, yeah, we're gonna find those votes, it'd been, it'd been different right now, because that's what he was counting on, them to find them 10,000, 11,000 votes that he was looking for. And something like that happened back, back in 1876. We're gonna talk about it, rough behavior. behave. So, uh, on the Clotilda, once those individuals, they brought them to this community afterwards. And they said, y'all look, we found 110 people in the woods in shackles and chain, naked. Now where they were, you can't get there by land. You can only get there by water. But everybody believed Timothy Mayer because he had clout. And these individuals, they couldn't speak English and nobody would believe them. Okay, because this is doing slavery. And so, Timothy Mann's brother took 30 of them to Selma, Alabama. Y'all passed through Montgomery. He didn't go to, I don't know if he went to Selma, but you know where, where it is. He took 30 of them to Selma. About 30 stayed here, and then 30 were just scattered from Fairhope, Daphne, as far as 100 miles from here on the water. And um, this was 1860. 1861, Civil War breaks out. But when the Civil War breaks out, those federal authorities and custom agents, they get out of Mobile. And the case was pretty much just dissolved because there was no one here to continue to pursue, prosecute them. Uh, 1863, two years later, the Emancipation Proclamation was signed. 
And so it abolished slavery in the Confederate States. Abe Lincoln, being the new person that he was, knew that the Emancipation Proclamation was just like an executive order. And we know what happens to the executive orders of previous presidents today, the next one, rescind because it's just a signature. Naked. And we lost their slaves again. So he worked vigorously to get the 13th Amendment passed. And when the 13th Amendment was passed, it abolished slavery throughout the United States. A lot of those individuals came back here. And they said, Lord, if we could just get back to where we got off of that vessel, we can get back home. They didn't like it here. People made fun of them. Um, they wanted to be back with their families. They realized they had been kidnapped. Uh, and, and so they came back here. There was one guy that could always bring structure to chaos. His name was Kosla. Uh, they renamed him Kajo Lewis. Some people say Kujo Lewis. Some people say Kazola, but it was Kosla. And so they went to him and they said, look, we want you to go to Timothy Mayor, work out something, whatever. We don't care what it is. We just want to get back home. The see, they were never really uh, brought in as documented slaves because then he would have been incriminated himself if he hadn't done that. So Kosla went to Timothy Mayor. Timothy Mayor said, look, I don't want anything to do with y'all. I don't know what you're talking about. I can't help you. You're on your own. And uh, he, he attempted several occasions. And finally, some of them went to work for uh, Timothy Mayor. Some of the readings say he paid them a dollar a month. Some say it was the old uh, sharecroppers. They would work and all of that money would go for food, clothing, and shelter. They never had any discretionary money. All right. Wow. And ultimately they did buy property in this community. They brought their talents, their culture, they built homes, they planted food. And they said, hey, you know what? We're not gonna get back home. We're gonna have to make a way out of nowhere. And here we are 160 years later. They were very resolute, uh, determined people. They survived uh, and they made a way out of nowhere. Well, uh, I stopped here because four years ago, um, that family was so powerful that they said, oh, that's just a rumor about that boat. We don't know how they got out there. So nobody never believed anything about the Clothes Hill. These families knew that their ancestors had come in on that boat, but the world didn't. Because our, um, you might say our historian during that time that everything was the gospel was W.E.B. Du Bois. And he said that the Wanderer in 1858 was the last ship to come in with illegally kidnapped individuals on it. So the Clotilda never got any press. And when they found the ship, I was in the auditorium the day they made the announcement. I can't put it into words to, to, to express the feelings and the sights of those descendants that live here today, that third, fourth generation. Uh, when it was finally broadcasted to the world that there is a cold field ship. And it was, they found it, it was 25 feet underwater. One of our local journalists, a guy by the name of Ben Raines, actually found the ship. The first one that he found wasn't it. He had to come back in two weeks and tell everybody that he uh, made a mistake. And uh, I think he lost 10 pounds that day, <laughs> you know. But what was eerie and weary is that one of the descendants of the ship, can't think of the lady's name, I think it's Miss Ballard. She went up to him and she was singing this spiritual. And the spiritual was, was to paraphrase it, was don't stop, keep trying. And he went back and found the real Clotilde, okay? And I've got his book here somewhere. I don't sell books, but I use them as props. It's called The Last Slave Ship by Ben Ray. And in this book, he tells you all of the documents that he eventually put together to determine the exact location. Because they've been looking for it, okay? Um, for quite some time. It's in our Delta. And um, I've been up on excursions. They will not tell you, they will not take you directly to where it is, but they will take you to the general area. And uh, that family actually had a camp up there, a camp house, because they would go hunting and fishing. The mayors, okay. 
and uh, so it's in that area, but they won't say here it is. Okay, that kind of thing. Um, I got one more question. Mm -hmm. If they were taken, um, if they were let loose, mm -hmm. and they with shackles and chains, how did they get those on? Uh, because the, uh, the uh, Captain Foster put them on. I mean, yeah. he, so he... when they released them in shackles and chains, how did they take them off? Like, or did they go let everybody leave? They, yeah, yeah so, so remember they, they took them off the ship and they left them out in the woods. Mm -hmm. Then they brought them to this community. Where was Captain Foster and Timothy Mayor's group that brought them? They were the same ones that put them on. Well, well, yeah, yeah. Once they got here, they took them off. But they had the the tools and the access to remove them. Okay. And uh, so, which is a good lead-in because when Ben Rains found the the, the ship, it, it, it hit the broadcast worldwide, and we had people, historians, anthropologists in here from all over the world. National Geo picked up the story and they sent in a project manager by the name of, of uh, Jim Daigle and he brought in 11 international divers. They were out there for two weeks, 14 hours a day. They brought up loose items from the cold field and they've done DNA testing on those items. He's been underwater for 160 years. And those uh, items are going to be on display in the heritage home, which we're going to go around by it. It would be open today, except that there is a product that they need to complete the construction that's on those ships out there in the Pacific that's waiting to come into port. And uh, right now it's projected to be around January or February before it opens. Now, when it opens, those items that they brought up and have done DNA testing on them will be on display in that heritage home. And the History Museum staff that we just left they're going to be the curators and they're going to write the narratives of the significance of those items. It might be some shackles. We don't know. It might be some neck braces, uh, but they, they brought up items. They came back actually two months ago. They went back down and they brought up more. Items. They really haven't released what they brought up. This last time he did say we brought up a shoe that they found. But well, we know who that shoe did not belong to. Right? Um, so those items are going to be uh, on on display in, in the heritage home. Um, the other reason I stopped here is because once the Clotilda was found, the state allocated $4 million and, and it's going to be a welcome center in this area to the left. All right. And, and so it's going to be constructed there. Um, they have met, not made an announcement date as to the start and completion date, but uh, I've interfaced with the anthropologists, the archaeologists, the engineers, and architects, so we know they're working. Money's in the bank, and that's where it's going to be. So we'll be able to walk in the welcome well, center. We won't be sitting out here in the van, okay? That's what's going to happen there. Um, then off script a little bit, I just like to share, especially with these young ones, that during the Middle passages, there were 25,000 voyages that came from Africa to the Americas. 25,000 trips that they brought people um, over. And it was a estimated that 12.5 million people, 2.5 million never made it. That's a lot of people that were either killed, they either committed suicide, or they died. 2.5 million is a lot. Okay. Most of them were in places like uh, Brazil, uh, Haiti, Cuba, Dominican Republic. Probably about a million to the United States at that time. Okay? Um, of all of those voyages, there's only 11 ships available today that still exist. 10 of them in South America. Same place as Cuba, Haiti, Dominican Republic, Brazil. Only one in the United States. Bingo, Clotilde. That's the historical significance, anthropology um, of that particular ship. And so um, those individuals that were on it came straight from Africa to Africa Town, meaning there was no interference of any of the blood. So that is from an anthropo anthropology perspective. Very, very profound.
they don't have to do me and whatever it is, 27, 22, 32, you know, 23, whatever that genealogy thing is. There's no, yeah, 23 and me. There's no interference at the any other blind. So historically, that is very, very instructive. All right. Um, and so I just like to point that out. And then something that I don't have no scientific information of none of those people with all them ABC letters and PhDs and MDs and all that stuff behind their name is that when hurricanes started in Africa, they come through the Caribbean, right up the Florida coastline, and tear up Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi. Guess what? That's the same route those ships came. Kind of eerie. Okay, but it's, it is the truth. Really weird. They said if you could empty that ocean, those 2.5 million people, there's a lot of bones at the bottom of it. That is amazing. I mean, that takes a lot of people in that period of time that lost their lives or committed suicide because they said they were not going to live in these these kind of conditions. Hey, this is the newest cemetery. It's open today. The only thing I have to say about it is that you can be buried in that this afternoon. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> We're going to go over in front of the old Plateau Cemetery, which uh, was established in 1876 by the descendants of the Clotilde. And uh, it closed in the 80s. Okay. Okay. This is Creole. All right. So this was the Creole fire station. See all the way at the top. Yeah, so this was a, a Creole fire station. It was a volunteer fire station. This was established before Mobile had a formal fire department. They used to put out fires for everybody, but you had to be a Creole working. And you had to have a letter authenticating you as one of those Creoles. And so, yeah, that's right. And they were established like about um, 13 years before Alabama was a state. And they would put out fires for everybody. The first door there, that's where the horse and the wagon with the water would come out of. There's a smaller one over here. The top floor was a great room. And this is a family's residence now. But they agreed to leave the front for the historical significance of it. Because this is a big, a big deal back during the day. Well, the uh, pole is still up there. On, it's still, in fact, they replaced it with the new one so that, you know, it can accommodate you there. The heritage home. So those items that they brought up from the Clotilda, they're going to be on display in here when it opens. And then they'll have the narratives of what they're all about. Are they still actively working? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, most of the items that they need are for the interior part that's on the ship. This is what it's going to look like when it's finished. Now, when it's open, we're going to have excursions leaving from downtown by water going up to the coast. Here. So you'll be able to get on the boat, and it's a 28 minute ride up to where it's located. And uh, uh, we had a young lady here from Howard, African American. She came last year, spent the whole summer here, and she's converted the 160 years into 28 minutes so you'll watch a movie on the way to the Clotilde, Clotilde to give you the history now y'all familiar with SCAD right School of Arts and Design Savannah they were here for three months they wanted to stay they did interviews throughout the community they actually uh, made a movie that they're polishing up now and it's going to be uh, released probably towards the end of the year Great, and I mean, and they are the premier marketing company in the world right now. All the Fortune 10 companies are using them. Coca-Cola's, the Pepsi's, and the, those big organizations, they're using, because they bring in these students and, and, they, and they just have talent, okay? Is so, the Clotilde in the same boat? Okay, I was watching um, the Henry Louis Gates. Yep. And he says that the majority of the time when they're finding ancestry they don't find a di direct link from uh, an african folk but the one time they found um this rapper what's his name 
Quest Love. Quest Love. Was it was it the Clotilde? Yeah, he's a descendant. Okay, of, of that's what I was thinking because I remember that name. I was like, why is that name so familiar? Yeah. Okay. So Quest Love is actually a descendant of is a descendant. Of and our Quest Love teamed up with a young lady from Mobile called Margaret Brown. And they have done a um, uh, production with some of the descendants for a movie that's going to be produced later this year. About yeah. And there's one more with uh, uh, President Barack Obama and Michelle. Uh, owner of a production company that is a part of Netflix, and that's another one that's going to be produced. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, in the process, there's a lot of uh, revitalization, okay, and uh, redevelopment of this community that will take place because you're going to see a lot of blight, empty lots, homes that need repair, and so. Uh, there are vertical market groups that are meeting uh, every two weeks. Even the shops look like this. So you're right on, right on target with the concept. Yeah. So the, the, what we're not going to do is bulldoze everything and come in with new houses. Yeah. See, they stole their names first. They changed all of them's names. Then they stole their language. Took their language. They converted them to Catholicism and Baptist and took their religion. They took everything that they called So the concept in the whole revitalization and redevelopment is to take a house like this. You see what we've done? You got new side and new roof, but it's the same house. Yeah. And so the concept is to do the same thing like over here to the left. Now, a lot of these people are, are, are middle age, you know, they're, they're in their 70s. And they're not going to go to the bank and take a loan out for forty, fifty thousand dollars. So we're looking at uh, ARC money, community block grants, things of that nature. A lot of shotgun, I mean, lots of like shotgun lots, because you, you know, in communities you can put more homes on a shotgun. And so the concept is to come back in and put a modernized, Afrocentric home which would be, you know, the shotguns have one outlet in the house. So this would be like multiple outlets and closets, central air and heat. Uh, uh, but you gotta have a porch. Yeah, You gotta have a porch. Yeah. The right uh, color scheme, but to modernize the home because it's gonna take that to get young professionals, African-Americans to move back in. And I, I, I'm not gonna move in next to this. I, so all of this in the overall scheme of the revitalization and the redevelopment uh, of this of this community okay and um that's what's happening so you're going to see a whole different place in in, in in three years okay and it's happening really fast uh that lot would be a lot that you here's another house that was you can see new roof new siding and the family still live there and so that's the whole concept, but see, yeah, chat. but a young professional people are not going to move in with this, like this over here. So we know that the city knows that and all of this is being addressed and it's under that umbrella to come up with the right uh, procedures and processes to again, keep the community that's here present and to bring in new young generations to fill that school back up it, it might have to be you know we got all these names for schools nowadays magnets and uh, academies and all these different charter fans, schools, charter schools. schools so you know in the process you find out the the right market for that and then you bring in people from here as well as around the community when you put the right um um, um, for us. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, you know, that, that was a church there. There used to be a big grocery store on the corner. I can't buy a bottle of water. So we know that once you get light back out here, then your, your Walmart, neighborhood Walmarts, your Dollar Generals, your doctors, your bonuses, your barbershops, your hair salons, 
I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, so this is Africa Town. Yes. Oh, okay. This is Africa Town. That's one of my sure. Africa Town is 12.5 square mile area, mm -hmm. and it's uh, a combination of four or five what I call colloquial communities. Like uh, we saw Kelly Hills, we saw Happy Hills, mm -hmm. uh, Lewis Quarters, all of those plateau. As a tourist, you don't know when you're in one and when mm -hmm. you're out the other because they're all right here. It would be like uh, in Africa, I mean, in Atlanta, you got uh, the West End, Peach, Peach yeah, Peach all Peach of that stuff, Glen in. So that's the way it is out here, okay? And um, um, there was, uh, there's a discussion about putting a memorial over here to the left where this, this frame of this church was, because there was a lady out here by the name of Ms. Schember, the Thelma Schember, she delivered over 2,500 babies as a midwife. Didn't lose a one okay, during her life. Yeah. And so uh, she delivered almost every baby. Wow, so this is Africa Town. This is our tour bus, our tour van. We did not know as many descendants as we know today. So the ones that we found, she put the American name in one column, and then in the middle column, she put the African name. And then she put the country that they were from. This was early on in the game. The first period of the ancestors, uh, uh, event that I came to, it might have been seven, and now it's about years ago. Yeah. 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 Did y'all go to your room by any chance when you were there? No, that's in Nigeria now. In Nigeria. Yeah, no, no. So there's a lot of stuff about it. Yes, this is end of our Mobile Alabama tour. And sir, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and why should people visit Mobile Alabama? Yes, thank you so much for allowing me to make this presentation um, on the Dora Franklin Finley African American Heritage Trail. My name's Eric Finley. I'm the docent uh, for this tour. And uh, we are located at 111 South Royal Street in beautiful Mobile, Alabama, 36602. And of course, we have a website, which is uh, www.dffaaht.org, which is actually Dora Franklin Finley African American Heritage Trail. Or you can just Google 
African American history or, or tours in Mobile and our site will uh, pop up. Uh, we do these tours 365 days a year uh, by appointment because we want to make sure that we have seats available and uh, they're $40 for adults, uh, $30 for senior citizens and um, $20 for children and anyone under 10, they're free. Uh, we have a 14 passenger, a 29 passenger. And then if you bring everybody, like two or 300 people here, we're bringing uh, four or five, 55 passenger buses for you to take the tour. Uh, we are a 501c3 uh, nonprofit organization. There's eight of us on the board and uh, we are all uh, eager and uh, excited to preserve and share the history about this 300 year old city uh, and the contributions that uh, African Americans have made um, to our city since its inception in 1702. Um, so again, uh, come visit us. We have a very diverse city and uh, we give you the, the gumbo flavor. It's a mixture of a, a little of it all. All right. Sir, thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Sir, awesome.